Then I was just uh, directing our attention to uh, to grab your Bibles if you have one there. Uh, we're going to be basing ourselves in Matthew chapter 21 today. And so please do uh, get a hold of your Bible, whether it's digitally, digitally or um, or physically. Uh, and you might want to turn to Matthew 21. Uh, later on, in a couple of minutes' time, Patrick's going to read that for us. Um, but uh, for now, let's, uh, let's just get prepared to read that, Matthew 21. Uh, and as you turn there, um, I'd just like to start by thinking... I wonder, I wonder what you would say uh, some of the greatest contradictions that you've ever experienced. Um, maybe it's something as simple as low-fat butter. Just doesn't sound right, does it? Or, or maybe even at the minute you think about the, the, the seemingly contradiction or contradictory things we're being asked to do now and that we socially distance. These are two things that, that seem totally contradictory to one another. Um, the, the, by the very understanding of what it means to be social, it means to be with people physically together, sharing space. Distance is the exact opposite. And indeed, as we think about that as a church, as we are a socially distant church at the minute, it seems to go against a, a huge part of what a church actually is. It's a gathering of people who share life, who encourage faith, love, care for one another. And yet in these days of, of socially distancing, uh, I hope that you know, as we've been looking at in previous weeks, that the church is still very much alive, very much active. And yes, we long to be together once again, um, but we experience God's grace in, in many ways as we continue to meet even in this in this virtual way. Um, but as, as I've been thinking about Palm Sunday this week, uh, it struck me that, that we could see the concept of a contradiction as part of the Palm Sunday story. I, I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you think of Palm Sunday. Maybe it's the the leaves and the coats being laid on the ground for Jesus to parade on. Uh, maybe it's the, the noise as the crowd shout, Hosanna. Maybe it's the, the scheming of the religious leaders in the background, anxious about this man who, whose popularity and teaching seems to be growing. Um, maybe, maybe you think of, the, of Jesus sitting on the colt of a donkey, riding into Jerusalem, all the while knowing that this was the week that he would die. Maybe you think of the disciples who, along with some of the crowd, are, are, are almost getting caught up, carried away by, by the fanfare and the pomp of, of this procession. I wonder what comes to mind when you think of Palm Sunday. Well, well one thing, as I said, that, <clears throat> that came to mind for me this year was, was the picture of the contradiction that, that Palm Sunday seems to bring. Or maybe, more correctly, how Palm Sunday seems to be a picture of an oxymoron. Now, now, if, like me, you aren't sure of the difference between a contradiction, an oxymoron, not, not to mention a paradox, they're similar in some ways, but essentially an oxymoron is a, is a statement of two words that seem to contradict each other. So, for example, deafening silence. Definitely, maybe. Clearly confused. Small crowd. Weirdly normal. These are oxymorons. They're two words that seem to contradict each other, but actually put together, uh, we understand the statement that they're trying to portray. And, and in the biblical account of Palm Sunday, I think we see an oxymoron played out in front of us uh, as we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And that oxymoron is Jesus as the humble king. And so to help us explore that a little bit more, as I said, Patrick's going to uh, bring our Bible reading for, for us this morning. So let's turn to Matthew 21, in the first 11 verses. Our reading this morning is taken from Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you, <clears throat> gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fool of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. 
It's an amazing scene, isn't it? Can you can you picture yourself in the crowd, shouting and cheering, waving the branches? What what a stir indeed there must have been. And did you notice that apparent oxymoron, the, the contradiction that we see in these words? See, I, I think we see it clearly in the quotation that Matthew gives us from the prophet Zechariah. And John also includes that reference in his account in John chapter 12. And, and we shouldn't miss the importance of the disciples quoting that verse from Zechariah 9 verse 9. You see, in doing so, they're clearly showing that this first Palm Sunday is not a coincidence, but rather it's further proof of the claims that Jesus was making. Because it was proof that he was fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies about the Saviour that God would send. But more on that later. Let's, let's turn our attention to that quotation. You see, we see it in Matthew 21 verses 4 and 5 where we see this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. So can you see the contradiction here? A, a king who comes gently, riding on a donkey? Surely that would, surely we would expect a, a king to parade with great authority and might and status, not, not on a donkey. Or indeed the foal of a donkey. Surely that's not how we would expect a king to come. It seems like a contradiction. It seems like an oxymoron. And I think this is actually clearer when we look directly at the verse in Zechariah itself. You see both Matthew and and John condense the verse slightly. So let's have a look at this verse in its fullness. So Zechariah 9 verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Can you see that? See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. That's how we would expect the king to come. But that's not the whole picture. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. That seems like a contradiction. But... But of course, that's not the case. You see, th- this seeming contradiction, this, this apparent oxymoron that Palm Sunday displays for us is, is actually a key to helping us understand who Jesus really is. Because what we see in this prophecy from Zechariah, then lived out in fulfillment by Jesus, is that he is the humble king. And, and a humble king seems to be an oxymoron for us. Surely a king has power and strength and authority and might and control. Yes, absolutely. And and in fact, Jesus has all of those things. He is the perfect example of those characteristics. But yet he is humble. He rides on a donkey, not on a great steed. And he displayed this this humility uh, throughout his whole life. He, He explained by his life, by his words and his actions, that his kingly rule was actually going to be one of of service and sacrifice. And and so we see this right in his, even in his, in his birth, we see the humble king. Just picture the manger in Bethlehem. It's, it's not the entry into the world that we would expect for the creator God to come in human form. Later in Holy Week, even, we, we can picture him on bended knee, washing the disciples' feet in the upper room. These aren't the actions that we would expect of the king of the universe. And for now, we see him riding into Jerusalem, not in in military might, not not in political power, but among ordinary people on a humble, simple fool of a donkey. But why is this so significant for us? Why is knowing Jesus as the humble king good news? Well, well, as we mentioned, it it speaks to us of the immensity of recognising Jesus as God with his people. The humble king who came into his creation. God incarnate, majestic creator God stooping to be with his creation. If you think of these verses uh, in the New Testament, in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And then later Paul writes in Philippians 2, being, Jesus being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. You see, this oxymoron of Palm Sunday, we see the humble king, and it reminds us of God stepping into our world. And Philippians 2 goes on to explain why that was so important. 
So he was being made in human likeness and being found, this is verse 8 of chapter 2, being found as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, see, Jesus came to this world as the humble king in order to die on the cross. And why did he have to do that? Well, because in, in his death on the cross, Jesus took the penalty of the sin of the world upon himself so that anyone who believes and trusts in his completed work on their behalf may know forgiveness from sin, may know rescue from sin's ultimate consequence, may be welcomed by God our Father, may be ushered into life with him for now and for all eternity. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And God knew that this was the only way for sin to be dealt with. He sent his son into the world to bring about his great salvation plan so that we might be saved, so that he might be glorified as his grace is shown to the whole world. And so Jesus comes as the humble king and he comes in order to save his creation. And so we have this oxymoron of Jesus, the humble king, in this first Palm Sunday. And and the Bible shows us clearly that that so much of the good news of Jesus doesn't seem to make logical sense from our perspective. Let let me show you what I mean. When we look later in Matthew's Gospel, we get a a growing series of, of seeming contradictions. So we see... In Matthew 21, later we've, we, we see him as the rejected Messiah. We expect the Messiah to be welcomed, but no, he is rejected. We see him as the betrayed companion, betrayed by those he trusted and loved. We see him convicted, even though he's innocent. We see that he would ultimately be the crucified saviour. These things don't seem to make sense to us. Surely the saviour would come in victory. Crucifixion doesn't look like victory. And so so Holy Week seems to be full of oxymorons. It doesn't seem to make logical sense to us. But in some ways, that's exactly the point. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, the message of the cross does seem like foolishness until we see that it is the only way that God has provided for our sin to be dealt with, for his grace to be shown, for his love and his judgment to be perfectly satisfied. You see, God became man so that he might take the penalty that was owed to man in order that man might be redeemed before God. God became man so that he might take the penalty that was owed to man in order that man might be redeemed before God or as we see that the Apostle John so succinctly put it in these wonderful verses that we've celebrated many times before this is how God showed his love among us that he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins God sent his son as the humble king to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins so that we would know the love of God. This is a a seeming oxymoron of Palm Sunday, but isn't it such good news? And so if if this is true, if this is the good news of Jesus, how how are we going to respond to this good news? Well, well, we see the reaction of of the crowd recorded for us in Matthew's account of this first Palm Sunday. Firstly, in in, in verse 9, we see those joyous shouts of praise, the hosannas, they, they ring out on the streets. And it must have been incredible. These cries of praise, that they, they seem to suggest that, that some people did understand Jesus' identity. That he was the son of God. And we know that because they use phrases like the son of David, which, which was reserved for the Messiah. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These are messianic terms. And so it seems that some people understand the truth of these terms. That this is indeed who Jesus is. But, but we also see in these verses that there's some who don't quite get it. They see Jesus as a good man, yes. And and even in verse 11, we see they call him a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. But we also know that by the end of this week, the crowd in Jerusalem are calling, crying out again, but they're crying out for Jesus to be crucified. And so it seems that, that many people's expectations of Messiah didn't allow for these oxymorons that we've been looking at. It didn't allow and comprehend Jesus as the humble king 
as the rejected Messiah, as the betrayed companion, convicted though innocent, crucified saviour. These realities displayed by Jesus, they didn't seem to marry with people's expectations of how God would bring his salvation. And, and so they, they didn't believe, they couldn't believe. And so how about, how about you? How do you respond to Jesus? As we picture him riding on that foal into Jerusalem, as we consider the week that lies ahead, as we think of his arrest, his trial, his, the abandonment that he feels at the hand of his friends, his, his brutal treatment, his eventual execution, how, how do we respond to Jesus? Are we going to humbly submit ourselves before this humble king? Are we going to recognise our profound need of him, our, our complete reliance upon him as the only means for our sins to be, to be fully and, and finally dealt with? And as we ponder those questions, and important questions they are, let's, let's not lose sight of the glorious truth that this Holy Week doesn't end with Friday or Saturday. But we know that next Sunday's coming. And we know that death was not the end for Jesus. He's not in the grave. He was not and is not defeated. Indeed, two more words needed to be added to this crucial good news story. And they are that Jesus is our risen Lord. There's no oxymoron there. Jesus Christ is our risen Lord. Risen because he, he defeated sin and the grave. Death could not hold him. He, he rose victorious. He's now seated in heaven in his rightful ruling place. He is risen and he is Lord. Because through everything that we've seen, we know that Jesus is worthy to sit on the throne of, of my life, of each of our lives. He is worthy because of who he is and what he's done. He's worthy to be worshipped, worthy to be adored, worthy to be obeyed, worthy to be praised. And so those of us who know him and who are trusting in him for salvation, we submit our whole lives to him. We seek his leading, his guiding in our every step. And so we strive in some ways to to have our whole lives sing out that chorus of Hosanna, the King is here. And so he is our risen Lord. And so as we reflect once more on, on this great Palm Sunday, let, let's consider the, the seeming oxymorons, the apparent contradictions that, that are shown through this most holy of weeks. Jesus is the humble King. He's the rejected Messiah. He's the betrayed companion. He's convicted though he's innocent. He's the crucified saviour and he is our risen Lord. This is what we celebrate so warmly, if I can put it that way, on Palm Sunday. And there's been a brilliant video brought together just to help us, uh, help us reflect, help us to think on, help us to, to capture the essence of this wonderful Palm Sunday. And so I'd like to show that with us and then we'll, we'll pray afterward. In a small corner of the city, a parade began. No internet, no announcements, no tweets. Word of mouth carried the news. And the parade had no floats, no balloons, no bands. Just the voices of the people singing one word. Hosanna. The word has no actual meaning. It'd be like trying to define the word hooray. But still, they knew what it meant. Hosanna, the king, has arrived. Jesus had been working quietly behind the scenes, urging people to not tell of what they saw. But how can you keep a secret like that? They were ready for him. They had been praying for his arrival for generations. The Messiah had come. Hosanna. They waved branches. They threw their coats on the road. It was all they could do. They gave him a breeze and they sang him a song. Hosanna. It was all they had. They would die for him. But what they didn't understand is that it was going to happen the other way around. The Pharisees were watching, waiting, planning. He was too popular. The crowds would follow him anywhere. But even if you silence the crowd, you can't silence creation. Even if you silence the crowd, the rocks would sing, the trees would take up chorus, and the earth itself 
would sing, Hosanna. Hosanna, the king has arrived. And so as we, as we conclude our, th- our thoughts around this Palm Sunday, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful day when we recognize you and we appreciate you as, as our humble king. As the one who came, not, not in great pomp and ceremony, but the one who came to seek and to serve. And yet, God, none of that reduces your authority, your power, your majesty, Father, it it just it adds to our wonder of how you would love us so much to enter your world. How you would fully and finally take the penalty of sin that was ours to pay and yet you as our atoning sacrifice would be willing to, to pay that sacrifice so that we would know freedom from sin, forgiveness from sin, life with you in all its fullness. God, we thank you. And today as we, as we reflect maybe on the, the, the wonder and the joy of the hosannas that rang out and the palm trees that were laid down, the coats that were flung on the floor, and God, we, we thank you that you are indeed worthy of that level of praise and adoration. And so we pray, Father, that you would help us. Uh, those of us who know and love you, you would help us, Father, to live a whole life in that attitude, that you would indeed receive that, receive that praise that is so rightfully due your name. And so come, empower us, we pray. Uh, Help us as we enter this holy week uh, to to be mindful, reflective, um, celebratory when that is is appropriate. Um, God, we thank you for what this week signifies for us. And we thank you, Father, uh, that you were willing to go through this week uh, so that we would know restoration with you. So we praise you, Father. And it's in your wonderful name that we ask all of these things. Amen. Amen.